Support for this episode comes from Modern Football Technology. Modern Football Technology provides real-time opponent tendencies and self-scout while eliminating manual data entry into Huddle, DV Sport, and Exos. If you're tired of tools that are time-consuming to learn and perform inconsistently at best, then we recommend Modern Football for a fresh perspective. Schedule a demo today at teammofo.com to see a battle-tested tool that's proven to perform and deliver value. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code CC10 to receive 10% off your first year. And listen to our recent episode featuring Folsom High School Defensive Coordinator Jordan Ersick to learn more about how the 2023 California State Champion uses modern football to dominate their opponents. what we do with a lot of effort and energy. Sometimes it's not as clean as you would like it to be from a technique standpoint. So we're always like correcting and improving in that area. But I, like the energy part's been big. And then I think you combine those two things in the weight room where I think we're doing really sound stuff and we're following things that I value is from a research standpoint and, and that I've gotten from other people and then being able to include that effort into it and our kids know it's important. I think that's really kind of springboarded our program probably more than anything else. How you do things is as important as what you do and Eric Kerr has done an incredible job constructing the how and what behind the work put in by his four-time state champion, Corner Canyon Chargers. Corner Canyon finished the 2023 season ranked number 13 nationally by Max Preps and in seven seasons, Corner Canyon head coach Eric Kerr has a record of 87 and 7. Today we talked to him about the approach he's taken and the details behind Corner Canyon's strength and speed programming, as well as their practice structure. And we take a look into their high-powered offense, which averaged 47.6 points per game and 533 yards per game in 2023. Their screen game alone produced 1,100 yards this past season, and we'll talk about the keys to a successful screen game. Be sure to stay tuned for our Winning Edge Takeaways, following the interview. What you see on tape is a direct reflection of what you teach and how you teach. Video is important, but if you don't teach well, you're not going to like what you see on your video. First Down Playbook has been helping coaches teach better for 13 years. It allows you to present installs, playbooks, and practice cards in half the time with NFL quality. Coaching tools like video pairing, A player app, practice schedules, and wristband sheets have made First Down Playbook a program management system with everything in one place. If you're in a position of leadership with your football program, receive a free one-week look at First Down Playbook. Call them at 512-814-6158 or visit them on their website or social media. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code COACH24 to receive a $100 discount off the normal $700 First Down Playbook team membership price. Links and the phone number are in the show notes. As coaches, we know that some of the biggest hurdles to our team's success can come from off the field. Your team needs support to tackle the endless list of expenses, uniforms, training equipment, travel, and more. But raising that money can feel like a full-time job. Thankfully, there's Vertical Raise. Vertical Raise is the premier online fundraising platform using innovative technology to create the easiest and most efficient system available. Raise more money in less time with a local fundraising coach who works with your team every step of the way to customize the ideal fundraiser. With options for online donations, digital discount cards, premium product sales, and even spirit shops, Vertical Raise has top-of-the-line solutions for every fundraising style. To find out more, visit verticalraise.com and we'll get you connected with an exclusive offer on your first fundraiser. We continue on with our Champions Series and we're joined by the state champs from Utah, Corner Canyon High School and the head coach of Corner Canyon, Eric Kerr. Coach, great to have you here on the podcast. I'm excited to dig into some of the things that make you guys successful. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. So, Coach, before we get into some of the specifics, really, that, that make a difference for your program out on the field, what's something, you know, for you and your development as a coach that was really impactful, whether that was, you know, a person you learned from or 
a problem you solved or an issue you had where you had to grow and evolve, what things helped or impacted you in becoming the coach that you are today? There's probably been a few things. It probably started early, like with my, I had a head coach in high school, my freshman and sophomore year that was just somebody that I looked up to. I just liked the way he went about doing things. And that's where I started to really love the game and started to like it. And then just kind of grew from there. And then when I got, when I finished playing in college, I got my first coaching job as an assistant. And that was with a guy named Alex Jacobson, who I was with for a while. But the part that was great about him is he kind of let me grow a lot as a coach. He gave me a lot of responsibility and I became an offensive coordinator after my first year. And then I ended up taking over for him in 2009, but like without a start and without having a guy like that, that I could really trust. And then when I was at Jordan, I had a couple, as a head coach, I had a couple of assistants that really helped. One of them was our line coach at the time that I learned a lot just up front about just blocking schemes, screen game, pass protection, um, just a lot of things. And, and he was always good that way where I could pick a, his brain. He played for a long time and played in the NFL for a little bit. And then we had another guy who was, was an assistant. He was, our, he was our receivers coach with us that also like the part that was good about him is he, I would have ideas, but I was always kind of like sometimes chicken about trying them. He would really push it like, no, let's do it. Like he was always good that way. Like, Hey, we're going to do this and we're going to go for it. And, and that was Robert Picker. And he was great. Wayne Jones was the other guy, really our practice style. So we had kind of both talked about it and I was kind of being a wimp and some of my other assistants really didn't like it. So that's when we started to platoon and started really. So we started going just offense, defensive guys. And then we were really going at a fast pace. So with the way we, cause we're a no huddle team we really started just implementing more and more of that, like in our practice style. So like five minute periods, 10 plays per script. And we just went really quick and fast and platooned and, and did more stuff like that, where we felt like our kids were getting enough reps to where they could be successful. And he helped me kind of really push that idea and, and helped expand upon it and helped get some of our other coaches on board, which was big. Cause they, I, that was one of the three things I had kind of talked about that I felt like has made a big difference for us in our program. And I don't know if that happens without him, and even some of the other stuff our other guys influenced on. So it was, it was a big one. You mentioned before we got going, uh, really uh, three things. You mentioned your weight room. You mentioned, you know, the off season speed and conditioning and agility that you do. And then the practice. And I want to dig into each of those. I mean, when you talk to anybody right now, uh, this time of the year, they're getting ready, you know, gearing up to get their teams back in the weight room and start developing them. And so it's something that everybody does, right? So what is it? do you think in, in the way you guys do it that helps set you apart, that's helped you win you know, four state championships in six years? I think probably the biggest part that we do, our programming's big and it's something I always have been kind of big or it's been important to me to kind of give my athletes or our athletes like the best opportunity to improve. So I want to give them like the best research-based programming I can give them and, and I studied a lot of that stuff in college anyway and have some certifications and things like that in that area that's helped there but probably you know I think just as important as that side of it would be our energy that we bring into it and I think the emphasis we put on it as coaches our kids understand that and, and that there's a lot of energy when we're in there they attack what we do with a lot of effort and energy sometimes it's not as clean as you would like it to be from a technique standpoint so we're always like correcting and improving in that area but I, like the energy part's been big and then i think you combine those two things in the weight room where i think we're doing really sound stuff and we're following things that i value is from a research standpoint and and that I've gotten from other people and then being able to include that effort into it. And our kids know it's important. I think that's really kind of springboarded our program probably more than anything else, because I feel like, especially with high school kids, you can make bigger physical improvements in high school kids than you can even like from a technique standpoint, maybe on the field, like as a receiver or whatever, like technically, yeah, we can get them better. We work hard at that, but I, I feel like we can make bigger jumps from a physical standpoint than we can from maybe a technique or even like a scheme standpoint. Like, I don't know that I can scheme a kid to get open or scheme a kid to be more physical in the, in the run game, but like the jumps you make, they're huge. Um, especially at this 
age, you know, when they're 14 to 18 years old, like their body physically, like because of all the hormones they got going on, they can really improve fast and in a big way, whether it's speed, power, agility, and strength, like those things are, you can make bigger jumps, I think, than anything you can do as a coach. The two things you mentioned there, the, the energy in the weight room and then the scientific approach, I want to dig into each of those a little bit here. But paint a picture for us of that energy. What does it look like, right? As, as the guys are coming into the room, you mentioned that you guys have a lot of energy. So what is it the coaches are doing? What is it your, your players, your leaders are doing, et cetera? What are the things that really bring energy to that room? Well, that's, that's the nice part now. I think initially we had to do more as coaches when we first came here because the weight room program, like that was what was being done in the weight room was not what we were looking for as a coach, especially from the energy level. So there was a little bit that we had to, we had to bring that out as coaches, um, the excitement and encouragement, like really as coaches. And then now, like our team brings that more than energy, more of that energy. So just encouragement, guys getting hyped for each other, cheering each other on, pushing each other, helping encourage them to, you know, finish lifts and finish weights and, and push their weight. Um, and that stuff gets contagious. So as that starts to happen, you see that spread amongst, you know, your seniors or your varsity players down to your young guys. They see other guys doing it like, oh, that's how it's done. And it just helps them push themselves to like another level. So there's a lot of excitement, a little bit of craziness, guys screaming and yelling and getting hyped for each other and encouraging each other. But there's a lot of energy that's taken into that because they want to improve and get better. And then I think that gets contagious. It just kind of feeds through your program almost like, you know, the old phrase is spreading like wildfire just because it kind of happens every day in there. And you can see it like I just I was talking about, it, you know, to try to paint a picture is, Kids coming in, they get warmed up, you know, they start getting into their, you know, they go through a few build up sets of stuff. And then, you know, as they kind of get into like their heavier sets or work sets on things, they, the energy continues to kind of build and the encouragement that they get from each other. On the other side of it, the scientific approach that you mentioned. So what is your weight room based on? You know, what, what's the programming look like for your guys and, you know, I know that that's probably a range of things because you have, you know, f freshmen coming in who maybe haven't lifted as much. And then you have some of those varsity guys, as you mentioned, who are able to, you know, they've they've been doing it. They know how it's done. I think that's a big part of it. We're trying to build those young guys and then still maintain like what you've already built on with your older guys and trying to balance those two. But our basis of our program, we're, we're you know, Olympic based uh, lifting program so like our our explosive movements are going to be our most important part and we train power in a bunch of different ways it's not just like cleans or or jerks or snatches which we do those right we do all of those but we do a lot of plyometric weighted jumps hex bar jumps like we do a bunch of different things that way or push jerk or you know weighted lunge jumps and different tons of different things in that Spectrum. So I, I'm not one of those strength guys or where I feel like they need to just, oh, you know, we're only doing Olympic lifts or like Olympic lifts are dumb. We're only going to do it this way. We're pretty open. I think there's a lot of ways to train power. So we're pretty open that way with our programming. And I feel like we do get enough frequency in all of them that we become really good at them. But it takes time. And I think sometimes strength coaches get a little impatient with that stuff. Like they want to see a perfect clean, like right out of the gate where really I, in my experience and watching kids, like it takes a long time to develop that if you're including like appropriate power and then wanting to move the bar fast. I think that takes a lot of time. So we do spend a lot of time on that, but also we, I try not to overcoach it early. Um, and, you know, guys are going to have a different approach than me on that. But I think what's most important for me with power development is are they moving weight and are they moving up fast? And I want to see them move it like so they're safe. So like if I see something that's really unsafe, like I'll I'll definitely get on them and correct, and we'll change stuff and go wider. But that's really important to us. You know, moving resistances really fast, what, whether it's you know through a hand clean, power clean, uh, clean and jerk, snatch, split catch, snatches, split catch jerks, any of that stuff, plyometrics, any of those things. We're looking for them to move stuff quick and apply a lot of effort into it. And then squat, like squat, we we're a, we squat different variations of squat. 
that we apply into that. Um, we're like just heavy back squats. We front squat a little bit. We've had a few little issues like just with that. So I get a little bit scared of that. I think they're great. Like I, I think there's so many good things out there that kids can do. I think sometimes this just philosophy wise, or we have our own opinions, but we, we mostly back squat. We use some variations with holds and, and squatting fast where we'll try to move the bar quick with, you know, lighter resistances or, you know, eccentric to fast speed squat stuff. We do a bunch of different things that way. And our programming changes with, you know, through different reps and sets. Sometimes we're linear, sometimes we're, you know, all over the place or undular, like we're up and down. So it changes a little bit. And then we do a bunch of posterior chain stuff like RDL, straight leg dead, single leg, straight leg stuff with like dumbbells and things like that to really protect them injury wise and protect them because we're going to want them to run fast too. So we do a bunch of different things from speed development too, where we're trying to protect them, keep their hands strong and and then a bunch of assistant lifts with that. And, and upper body is a big priority, too. We do an upper-lower split, so we go lower our first day of the week on Monday and then lower on a Thursday. And that lower that first lower day is usually a heavy squat day with the speed stuff first or the Olympic lift stuff first, and then into our heavy squat day. And then that second day, we'll train another, like, Olympic-type movement with some jumps with, like, an uh, accessory squat day. So like a squat and hold day and that day is usually a lighter squat day because we'll usually just squat heavy once a week and then do some type of variation and then our tuesday friday days are upper body days where we and it's usually something that follows that similar path where we're pretty we, we bench and we'll bench like you know if we go pretty heavy that day or or we're pushing intensity pretty heavy that day then we have to switch and go like usually some type of accessory bench day or incline day that second day. So it's pretty fun. And I enjoy programming it a bunch. And I think we do a good job of trying to put our kids in a good position where they develop a lot athletically. And we, we do stay pretty basic with like our fundamentals. Like it's not, I don't want people to get the picture that we do a bunch of different things. Like we do a few things and we kind of stick to them and, and try to get our guys good at them. Uh, one question I have for you was, you, know, you mentioned the speed of the bar that you want them moving the bar fast. Do you guys use anything? You know, I know there's there's definitely some technology. Do you guys use anything with that? No, I wish. I wish we had stuff. I mean, there is there's stuff out there. I just it's so expensive. It's it's tough to to like afford some of it in a college program. But there's so there's such good technology out there now that you see that you wish you had. Um, so you can evaluate that with guys, but a lot of it's just visual for me. Like you can, you can see it pretty easy. I've been doing it a long time now too. And so we'll work on that. Like it's a constant of, you know, having guys go lighter and move it in a better way. But yeah, there is some definite, definite equipment out there that does make that nice. If anybody, you know, has access to that stuff that can, that has a lot of value in a program. So you talked about doing the explosive stuff first, sprinting first, then explosive lifts, then some of the heavier lifts. Obviously, that's uh, that's something important in your programming. And so, with that, uh, where have you really learned those types of philosophies? I guess there's a lot of different places you can learn, and a lot of similar people. Um, what things have you really felt have been most influential in helping you develop your off-season program? Well, I had a couple of guys in college. There was a guy named, uh, he was one of our professors. His name was Jay Todd. He kind of helped us with a lot of stuff, or at least just got me started in that right direction. He he did a class preparing us for the, the CSCS certification through the NSCA, which I did. And that's kind of the uh, where it all started from a little bit or format from. And some of what I do has moved away from that a little bit, but that's still the foundation of where I got a lot of my experience and knowledge from was from him and that class and, you know, the CSCS certification. I, I've changed a little bit of stuff, but just exercise order, exercise progression, some of those things I think still hold a lot of value that they that they do, and, and we do a lot of that. And even our running stuff like we do, we do a lot, most of our running first, and then we'll go into the weight room after that so or our sprint work and development what is, what does the sprint work look like for you guys and you know being in utah i'm, I'm not necessarily quite familiar with 
what the weather gets like in the winter. I know for me, it's not great in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. I'm sure it's not great for you guys <laughs> either. No, it's rough here. It's uh, that's a that's a good question because so I I coach track too. I'm our sprints coach on our track team and our our track teams. We've been lucky. We've or not lucky because we, we work hard. I won't say lucky, but we've had good kids. That's probably where we've been lucky. So we've been able to win. I think on the guys that I think we just won our fifth or fourth title in a row, something like that. And we've I think a lot of it or some of it has definitely been by the success of our sprint side and our guys that a lot of them that play football run track. I kind of have a good good group that I get to lean on a little bit with that as far as those those football kids they all want to do it it took a little while to build it up early on but I think they've seen a ton of value in what we do there so and then we do a lot with our football program too but some of it just varies so typically on a on like a if we're just talking straight football we'll vary between like acceleration stuff early on in the off season like in January acceleration a little bit of change direction but and then a lot of technique work and then we'll build into more some like max velocity or top speed type work as we progress through. And then we start adding in more agility or change of direction you know, work as we kind of get closer and closer to the season. And then we jump into our outdoor season where we're combining both like a little bit of acceleration, max velocity, and then even just some speed endurance work with our kids that I think really helps. And then when we're doing that, because of the volume of the sprinting, we have to back off our volume a little bit in the weight room too, because I'm a big track guy and I want them to be successful. Right. So I don't, I don't want to beat them up a ton in the weight room with a bunch of volume in there and then take them out on the track and try to get them going that way. So there's definitely a lot of balance and a lot of thinking that goes into programming as we go in those, in those different phases. But we really will spend a ton of time acceleration early and then just movement patterns, different things that we'll do, get them moving around in different directions in different ways. And, and then we'll build off on that. Some of it will be, you know, we'll just back pedal to a sprint, learning how to flip their hips. We'll do a bunch of that stuff in hallways a lot, is what most of it is in January. We have been able to get out on the track a little bit here in December. It's been kind of nice. We had like a 58 degree weather day a couple of days ago. So we've been able to get out and do some of that. And then, in the summer, after we finish our track stuff, we really start pushing into the change of direction. We'll do pretty heavy change of direction drills, probably like 10 to 12 drills a day on the two days we do it, which is Tuesday and Thursday. And then our Monday days, like usually we sprint 50s, like 10 50s in groups with about two and a half minutes rest in between, and just to help add in a little bit of that max velocity acceleration and then helping them get prepped for how we play football wise. And then that second Wednesday or that Wednesday or our second speed day will be a big max velocity day where we're working on really top end speed. And we do it not just linearly. We do a bunch of curved sprints and different things like that, that we've, we've progressed more into as I've gotten more and more into that kind of stuff. We do a lot of like curved sprints. We Luckily we have all these lacrosse and soccer lines all over the field. There's great lines out there that we run along for, curve sprinting that's great and I think has added a lot of value into our program so they're because you rarely run linearly in in on the football field so that's added a bunch of value for us too yeah a, a couple questions there or or I guess points to make the the rest time the recovery time I know that's very important it's something I didn't necessarily understand as a, a head coach completely but getting them that recovery time between those sprints is really important to help them develop that speed yeah, it's huge. You want them to really recover. Like there'll be times where they're like, and they want to go super right. real. I mean, especially like with some of our track stuff when we're really cranking out some like flying sprints or max velocity stuff. And they're like, Hey, let's go. And I'm like, Hey, like it's an eight minute recovery. Like you're going to have to wait. So like they just, cause they want to go, like they feel good. And sometimes we'll go a little off of that and we might speed it up a little bit. We really try to try to slow them down because we want to train really, really fast. And, and if anything, reduce a little bit of volume, when, especially when we're training fast, because we want those reps to be, you know, really, really quality reps and, and develop their speed. Yeah, we talk a, a lot on the podcast about the linear speed. I, I honestly don't know if we've ever talked about curved sprints before here. So I would love for you to talk a little bit more about that, you know, its importance, and then a little bit just on the the programming you mentioned, you know, just running the different curves on the field, et cetera. Key points, coaching points for, you know, putting together the programming for those curve sprints. 
Yeah, and th there's some that have like a degree of curve that we have out on our field because that's really where we use most of it. Like we have like our center soccer lines on the in the middle of the field, and then we have like our lacrosse lines on the ends, and the, and they're all varying degrees. And the biggest thing like you're coaching with is a little bit of lean, and it, and it definitely helps develop like ankle strength and like them be able to apply force, you know, with those different angles that they're running at. Um, and learning to do that, a lot of it's going to be just repetition to get used to it. We we coach it up for sure, but probably the biggest thing we coach is they we want them to maintain like some of their top speed mechanics as they're trying to do it, like not breaking stride. We want still good knee lift, toe lift, good backside recovery mechanics as they apply those forces at different angles and different you know directions as they're turning. And we'll go anywhere from like a pretty not a really high grade curve to where we'll get like really sharp curve stuff where we're doing like figure eights out on the field. So I, I love the stuff and it's becoming a lot. It's been, it's been around for a while actually, but mm -hmm. it's just becoming more and more popular. I think in the last 10 years, we're starting to see a lot more of it around and guys coaching it and teaching it. And, and I think we always felt like I did. I always felt like I was getting enough of that with all the agility and, and training that we did on the other two days, but not really, you don't ever really get a like max like sprint or where you feel like you're getting up to a high enough speed where you're really challenging some of that. And, and some of it might fit a little bit more for your like DB linebacker receiver, running back quarterback types, you know, but it's still great for your linemen too. Sometimes those guys look at me when we're doing some of those long curve sprints. Cause the one, the one ends up like if you, measure the whole curve it ends up being about 55 yards and sometimes they look at me like when am i doing this like 55 <laughs> yards on this curve so but it's great for them like just overall fitness too sometimes i don't think it has to be so specific all the time you mentioned practice being a big part of the success you guys have had and, and the way that you structure your practices put those together you mentioned a little bit about moving to more of that up-tempo practice but Talk to us about the way you guys practice and what that looks like over the course of the week of a season. We start our Mondays. We'll go in. We'll watch a little bit of film right at the end of school of our opponent and give them like a scouting report. So they at least have somewhat of a clue that because if you, you're like most high school kids, most of your high school kids, unless you are with them, they won't watch a ton. You'll get the rare kid that'll do it pretty good, actually. So we want to make sure they at least have an idea of what they're going to see, what we're going to see that week. Then we'll take them out on the field. They warm up for about 10 minutes, and then we jump right in to our five-minute periods. So we'll do like five minutes of a combination kickoff, kick return, drills and then maybe like a punt and then we'll jump right to like at a, I like to do an opening drive period at the start of our practices where we kind of drive our or we try to move the ball the length of the field offense versus the defense number one, ones versus ones kind of an attention getter get them kind of going for the practice to start it off right and then we'll jump into a little bit of individual just and it's scripted every five minutes you know maybe we're going to work with our quarterbacks you know, some footwork stuff for five minutes and maybe work some level throws for five minutes and then some routes on air timing with our receivers for five minutes. And then usually we'll split off and do a little bit of like maybe like screen work where we're throwing bubble screen and tunnel screen for five minutes just from an offensive standpoint. Then we will go do one-on-ones for five minutes and maybe we'll go red zone where we're going working from the 15 and then the 10 and then the five and then switching sides. And then we'll hop to like inside, maybe an inside run period while our receivers um, and DBs go work releases, you know, during that time for five minutes. Um, then we might jump back together and do a skelly period while our O-line, D-line does one-on-ones against each other. And then we'll jump back and maybe do two periods of scout against our scout, scout defense with an emphasis. So maybe our first period we're working our screen game paired with like our 50 or our quick game series stuff against the looks we're going to see. And then the next period might just be all blitz run for five minutes. We, we'll, we'll go 10 plays each five-minute period. And then usually we'll come back and maybe work like punt return versus what we're going to see there, punt for five minutes. And then we'll jump back and do maybe a couple more scout periods with maybe where we're working our – where we're going to try to go really fast because we do a bunch of tempo stuff. So we call it our cheetah period where we go really quick. 10 plays and it'll go fast and like they're kind of dragging they don't like that period very much and then we'll go like a, 
like maybe a play action period for five minutes and then we'll jump back and work third and short with our starting defense and our defense is doing the same thing like they're doing periods the same way and they'll just continue that and then we'll usually finish off with some type of compete period again whether it's like a two minute or a third down period where we're looking for up downs and we script it all like we'll script script all 10 plays versus the defense what side of the field we want it on which a lot of coaches do but that way it moves fast too and I go through the things that I've scripted for or game plan for and it makes sure I get to all of them and the different situations we want them in and and then we'll all re-script that every day because we'll change like the situations and periods as we go throughout the week and add a little more scout looks and different group compete periods, perimeter runs and different things like that. What's been the key for you in, in doing this to get that scout team running efficiently? Script and everything. That's been huge for us. So typically we start in the middle of the field, like as far as like not left hash or right, it's just right in the middle. And then it, it'll be a certain look for four plays. And, and that's all put on like a, you know, like everybody does, you know, they put them on a card, but they'll run that same defense for four plays. And it's probably maybe their top look out of a two by two look or out of a balance set. Cause we'll usually work our balance sets there and then we'll go left hash and work the same thing. And it'll be, but they'll do three plays of the same look. So they start to get it down. You don't have to give the defense a new look every time we want them to kind of get comfortable with like the, what they do best defensively. <laughs> And then we'll switch to the right hash and do the same three. And usually it's like their favorite stuff, typically. So then the defense, by the time you get to the third day, like they're on it. Like they're, yeah, we already know what to do here. So that part's been really good for us. But it's, the scripting part's been huge. So they know exactly what you want. And then I'm also knowing what I want to see versus that look for us offensively as they're going into it too. So it, it helps both of us on both sides. In being up tempo like that, what's the the mix between y- your first team and your second team, and you know the amount of reps? I guess you're able to get those guys to to get them prepared as well. It's been really good. Like our lower levels have done really well. Like JV sophomore and freshman teams have all done really well since we've been here, and I think that's why. I think because you are able to maximize reps so much, like you talked about with tempo you're able to get so many, you know, reps versus certain looks and whether it's a play action pass, run game, perimeter run game, screen game, drop back game, like you get so many looks at that, that it just helps you so much. And we're able to maximize, I think, our time. As you get later in the week, how are you scaling that so that you're also paying attention to their legs? So they're, they're ready to go. They're primed for Friday night. Yeah. So there's, it's, there's kind of some interesting data that a lot of guys have gone to with that. And I, I'm interested in it too, actually, but they do like the, their fast days, but they'll like do mm-hmm. low volume, like the days before they play. We still do like a typical walkthrough, but we kind of move. It's not really a walkthrough. Our guys like run routes pretty much at full speed and our, just our defense that we're going against doesn't come at full speed, but we shorten stuff too. So our practice gets shorter and shorter as the week goes on. And we always monitor that anyway, too, especially our like speed guys that run a ton, like all our receivers, they're rotating a lot also, which helps build up your depth too. So pretty much every other rep they rotate in and out of during our periods. There's some compete periods where they'll take multiple reps, but we'll, we'll decrease that. And then we still lift two days a week during the season. And then like that third, like I said, that Thursday day, it's pretty, it's sharp, but or we expect it to be sharp, like, but it's not a lot of volume. It's pretty minimal in what we do there. With the weight room during the season, what does that look like for you? We push it pretty good. We're pretty high on intensities, which I think some people are not, like they're a little unsure of just because the injury risk. But I want them, like, I want them to stay really close to their, you know, peak strength or what we just tested out at. So we we push that our percentages will be up above 90 for our work sets for at least four or five sets there on like squat and bench and same with like clean like it we'll have kids do like say if I have, I have a kid that cleans 315 on hand clean like he'll he'll push up to that like during the season too I've even had kids that'll like start bumping above their maxes which is sometimes typical with high school kids and training age and they're still developing technique that's not always uncommon, but it, you'll see it a little bit for sure. 
Coach, I appreciate you sharing those three things that have made a difference for your program, but I think I'd be remiss as the host of this podcast to not ask you about the offense because you guys put up some ridiculous points here this season. So talk to us a little bit about the offense you're running and how you guys, beyond the Jimmys and Joes, how you guys are able to get so many points on the board. I think like you said, I mean, a lot of it comes down to players first, but, you know, besides that part of it, so up front, or in our run game, you know, so we operate out of like 10 personnel or four wide most of the time. Uh, we did actually add more tight end stuff and 20 personnel a little bit this year, but we run a lot of GT counter. And then like, so like oh, the old, you know, Washington Redskins guard tackle pull stuff that everybody's running. And we've done that for a really long time out of our spread game. I mean, I've been running that since 2004 when I was at Jordan, Jordan, but and it's, I think it's continued to gain a ton of popularity now. You see it around a ton. And then we run power read a bunch. And then we run a lead draw with our quarterback. And then a lot of inside zone and different ways we'll run inside zone scheme or like more mid zone, I guess, is probably more accurate. But that's really the basis of our run game. And then we run like a slip screen, a tunnel, and a few other screens. But those two are like our main screens. And we run those quite a bit, like – I think we had almost close to, I think it was right close to 1,100 yards on screen game this year. Um, so it's it's a big part of what we do, um, if, especially if you include like our bubble screen. We ran a lot of RPO bubble with our zone scheme stuff and counter scheme. And then in our pass game, we run a decent amount of play action, but I would say like our probably biggest pass concept that we run is like our deep cross stuff or over routes or climb routes, whatever anybody wants to call them. We call them over routes for us, but we spend a lot of time running those and, and being able to take shots. Usually we're, we have something short to the flat and over out over the top of that some way and then a deep post and a dig in behind it somewhere too. So it's pretty basic stuff, but we, we I feel like we execute it pretty well. And we get into some other things. We run a bunch of cell concepts, hitch game, bender game, where we're trying to bend guys off of two safeties and – and I think probably the most important thing I would guess that we do offensively is we give them a bunch of reps, but then also it's kind of weird because offensively you always want to try to dictate. And I think we try to dictate with tempo on what teams can get into, but a lot of times we will call and everybody does this, but we'll call a lot of based off what we get defensively. If you're going to give me a good run box, we're going to, what we ran for everybody kind of focuses on what we do pass game wise, but I, I think we ran for 2,700 yards this year. We had two 1,000 yard rushers. One was our quarterback. The other one was our running back and they both did it on about, I think the quarter, the running back was around nine and a half yards per carry and the quarterback was around eight for both of them. So situationally, like if you're going to give us a, a four, five, six man box, we're going to take advantage of that. Um, as much as we can and it, it gets tough sometimes because I like chucking it too I like throwing the ball a lot and you know sometimes when teams just want to like just basically hand you the that like we'll do that which happened a little bit in our state championship game we had a couple of good receivers that teams were taking away through as we went through the playoffs so we really hit our run game pretty hard the last couple of games which was great for us uh, and we want that balance and then explosive plays we had a lot of plays over 20 yards this year I went through it but I don't have the info with me but I think it's the most we've had since I've been here on tracking some of that day. Like our yards per pass attempt for Isaac was right at 12 yards this year, which is where we want to be. I think the highest we've had it around was like 14 with Jackson Dart when he was here. But YPA is always like a big marker for us on how explosive we're being. And then trying to, like I said, we want to try to dictate some of the things we'll do with that as tempo to try to keep things teams from getting into a bunch of different pressures or even coverage looks and you know because they, they've got to get in something that they trust too when we're going super fast and sometimes it's not maybe something that they've worked a ton so yeah we that's kind of the basis of what we try to emphasize on we're going to counter against what teams try to do if they're a big pressure team we're definitely going to try to screen them and protect a little bit and take some shots downfield and still work some counter run game because I think Gap schemes are a great way to slip a gap versus, you know, hard pressure teams. Um, we've been successful with that. So, yeah, that's kind of what we do. And then just get our kids coached up to execute it. 
Yeah, well, obviously that's a, a huge part of it. There was a number that jumped out on me, and you said you had 1,100 yards on screens, and, and I think a team really at any level, but especially at the high school level, if you could get good at screens, boy, does it, it really open up the possibilities for you to move the ball down the field. I mean, there are those times when, for whatever reason, you know, your guy's not in a rhythm, he's not hitting things down the field, but when you can give him, you know, that short little five, six yard pass to to somebody who then gets the ball in space and you get blockers out in front of them, I think that's huge. So for you, coaching up the screen game, what do you think are some of the, the, the key coaching points that have made you guys so successful at it? It needs to look just like our pass protection and everything that we do off of that. Like, so whatever your pass pro is, you, it like the whole setup at the start of the screen needs to look exactly like what you do when you drop back and throw it. Cause you know, if you're dropping back and throwing teams are worried about your pass game and you're making big plays, their first thing they want to do is create pass rush on you and create some pressure on your quarterback. So the best way to counter that is you make it look the exact same, whether you're running tunnel or, or slip screen and and we do some different varieties like we'll motion or we'll run it to the field or the trips or at a two by two and different things like that so it's they can't just sit on it on one side or the other but it, that's the key the protection has to look the same and then our receivers have to block really well in it too so for both of them whether it's bubble screen especially but like our slip and our tunnel, like it, those blocks are critical for us by those guys. So there's a big emphasis put on that too to make that happen. But really getting setting it up, making it look like it's going to be the same pro that they've seen every rep or every other rep, and they're flying upfield, and then being able to slip a guy or slide a guy underneath and get a receiver to block a linebacker, and then get our guys up to the next level. I think it's critical. And we spend a ton of time on it. We'll wrap it a ton on air especially like in the summer and things like that. And then we'll get into it more and more full contact stuff. And we do it. We work it every day. We'll work it on air. We'll work it with just our receivers and our running backs. And then we'll add the linemen into it and just drill it and set it up. And the pro is really the key. If, if guys get too impatient up front or they don't sell their pro in the right way and they don't pick up gaps the right way or whatever off pressures, it really can screw the screen up but that's what's critical for sure coach i really appreciate you giving us a a glimpse into your program and letting us take a look at what has helped make you guys successful again for uh, the last six years state champions in utah certainly best of luck to you guys here in 2024 and defending your state championship and we'd love to have you back again sometime and talk some more ball appreciate you thanks keith thanks for having me on Here are our Winning Edge takeaways and ideas for implementation. 1. Surround yourself with people who will push you. This is good for anyone's personal success, but I believe it's extremely important for a head coach and leader. Coach Kerr talked about his assistants and their role in helping improve the program, which was the result of pushing Coach Kerr to implement new ideas. 2. Embrace both effort and science. I look at it a little different than the cliche, train smarter, not harder. I think a better saying, especially when looking at what Corner Canyon has done, would be to train harder and smarter. Coach Kerr pointed out that the most important thing is that his players bring the effort. Then he and his staff look at the science and train the techniques so that their training is smarter as well. And three, know the keys that make any aspect of what you do successful. That allows you to repeat success. Coach Kerr shared that throughout the interview, whether he was talking about their strength and speed programming or their screen game. It's easy to see success and pat yourself and your players on the back for it, but the challenge is to boil it down and understand the details that made it successful and will make it successful in the future. Follow all we're doing on coachingcoordinator.com. You can sign up there for a free weekly tip sheet, which runs down the best ideas from each week. And follow us on X at Coach K Grabowski.